My name is Mark Pilstrom with the law firm of Fagri and Benson. Um, and again, I do mergers and acquisitions, including representing uh, med tech companies, including uh, buy sell side. Um, and I'm a member of our medical technology group and uh, our liaison to uh, AdvaMed. Uh, I am filling in today for a colleague of mine, John Zimmerman, who is still recovering from ACL surgery. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel. To my immediate left is Chris Johnson. Chris is the uh, president of Affinity Capital Management and a managing general partner of Affinity Ventures 3, 4, and 5. Uh, previously, she was senior vice president and chief uh, administrative officer of Medtronics. Uh, during her 17-year tenure there, she was president and general manager of the vascular business at Medtronic, as well as the president and general manager of the tech arrhythmia management business. Uh, she holds a uh, BA from St. Olaf, right across the Cannon River from my school. Uh, and she serves on uh, several boards uh, of portfolio companies and nonprofits. To her left is, is J.P. Peltier, uh, who is a managing director uh, and a member of the healthcare investment banking group at Piper Jaffray. Uh, J.P. has 10 years of investment banking experience at Piper, focused exclusively on medical technology uh, on the medical technology sector. Uh, he provides medical technology uh, counsel on investment banking services related to uh, equity and debt financing together with merger and acquisition advisory services. JP's prior experience includes five years at Home Services of America, a Berkshire Hathaway uh, company uh, where he served uh, in a corporate development capacity and led the mortgage banking division. JP is a University of St. Thomas grad and a Kellogg grad. Um, and to his left is Chad Cornell, who is vice president uh, of Medtronic Business Development. In his role there, he's responsible for oversight and coordination of Medtronic's mergers and acquisitions, licensing, and minority investment activity. Uh, Chad joined Medtronic uh, in 2003, uh, became a director in 2005, and a senior director in 2008. Uh, he, before then, he was uh, at Sidley and Austin in Chicago for about five years, working on M&A and securities offering. Chad has an undergraduate degree from Marquette University in accounting, and he earned his JD from University of Pennsylvania. And to his left is Dennis War, uh, who is the president and CEO of Lutonix, which he co-founded in 2007. Uh, previous to that, Dennis co-founded uh, Velasimed in 2001 and took the lead of that company as its president and CEO until it was acquired by St. Jude in 2005. Um, following the sale of Velocimed, Dennis spent about two years as a, in the uh, venture capital industry as a managing director of Rivervest Ventures. Uh, he served on board of directors of numerous medical device companies, and he is also a board certified uh, interventional cardiologist. Uh, who, before the founding of Velocimed, uh, practiced for te 10 years in, in clinical practice. The first thing, that, or generally what we wanted to address on this panel is just is changes that are impacting investors and, and CEOs and, and corporates. So to that end, I wanted to uh, get the panelists' take on the impact of some of the regulations uh, affecting physician relationships. And let me give just a little bit of background um, that I think might be relevant to this discussion, including the fact that, as you might all be aware, recently the uh, Health Care Act that was passed included the Physician Payments uh, Sunset Act. Um, and that essentially, that act requires that uh, med tech companies have to report all payments uh, and other transfers of value to physicians that exceed 
$10. So I'd like to start out by getting the panel's uh, thoughts on, one, how physicians are being used by companies today in the design and development of new devices and get a sense of the trends um, re regarding compensation in light of uh, some of these, uh, the, the regulatory environment in place. In other words, are, are the levels increasing or decreasing? Are people focused more on cash than stock? You know, we can also talk about uh, valuation implications and challenges regarding physician ownership of shares. So let me start out uh, by getting uh, Dennis's perspective on, on this topic. Uh, and I think Dennis <coughs> has an interesting perspective in that he was 12 years as a clinical physician and now a CEO. Yeah, I, uh, um, thanks. Yeah, a couple comments. Uh, the first thing I would say, I think that the pers that the pers effective on this might be a little different uh, in small pre-revenue pre companies versus, versus large revenue producing companies. Uh, but I think in today's world, and this is how we do it you know, at, at Lutonix, is, is that I think that uh, um, equity for physician uh, consultants uh, is really off the table. You know, we, we, we don't do that. Um, uh, and I, I think it's different from what has been done maybe in the past. But I think that creates a lot of problems, you know, on the side of a, of a company like us because future acquiring companies may look at that like uh, future customers are incentivized. You know, it's just, it's just not where you want to go. On the, uh, on the physician uh, compensation, we certainly don't expect any doctor to consult for us for free. Nobody does that in the world. Um, but. Uh, but what we do do is we sign uh, confidentiality, obviously, uh, you know, agreements with, all, with any physician consultant their medical advisory board member, but we expect all of those uh, members to um, track their hours and if they work on our behalf at a, either a medical advisory board meeting uh, or something like that or participate in a strategy session, they track their hours and they send us just in the same way an attorney would the hours uh, uh, that they actually work by invoice at the end of each month, and we compensate them on what is a industry standard, which is uh, 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 very easily uh, obtainable through AdvaMed, you know, for what's reasonable compensation for a physician for their time committed. We don't do, we don't do annualized, say, consulting contracts for X number of dollars for the year, for example. It's, uh, it's hourly rate, uh, send in your invoice, and, and and uh, that way, we uh, uh, we feel that we avoid any uh, any appearance of conflict of interest, and and the doctors really appreciate that. By the way, I, I mean ninety eight percent of all doctors really appreciate that, and with that with that approach, we've not had any trouble at all whatsoever. Um, uh, virtually, without an exception, no doctor has turned us down to work with us under those terms. Great. Uh, do they have a problem billing? Uh doing their bill, either quarter hour billing. It's really, no, it's billing. really funny. It's really funny because uh, sometimes we have to re-remind them that they haven't sent in, you know, that, hey, by the way, you were, you know, you were here and you never sent us anything. And they, I mean, it's, it's, it's literally the, the, the pendulum switch is to that side of the equation yeah. where they actually um, um, uh, underbill and we have to remind them that, hey, you know, you kind of went out of your way to help us. There's a variety of facets where this impacts us. First of all, we have the diverse group of businesses, each with its unique set of physician groups and societies, and as many of you in the room know, different physician groups and specialties um, have had unique challenges. They look at the world differently, and <clears throat> while you want to recognize that and treat them differently, there's also a big push as health care reform uh, evolves to treat things more uniformly. It, um, and you mentioned uh, the transparency initiatives and, and you know a big company like Medtronic and all of our competitors are front and center and we're doing a lot of work internally, spending a lot of money trying to collect information in ways that we never have had to do before. And as Dennis alluded to, the physicians are in a unique position because uh, they want to advance science and want to advance innovation, yet at the same time they're being pressured to keep their names out of the papers mm -hmm. and, and to stay below the radar 
as it were. And so uh, if I had to sort of synthesize all these, these you know, countervailing forces down, I'd say at Medtronic, we're struggling between keeping the innovation uh, vibrant and dynamic from the physician end of things because, you know, as, as uh, my, my boss, Rick Coons, talks a lot about, in devices, the physician has always been key to innovation. Unlike pharma, where a lot of the R&D uh, is, is done in the lab, and physicians are obviously a big part of that, but still, most of it's done in the lab. Devices, it's been very different. A lot of the advances we've seen have come from the, the bedside you know, back to the company. So how do you keep that dynamic and vibrant? And as Dennis said, you can't expect uh, people to do things for free, especially when they're, time, they're being pulled in a lot of different directions. So how do you compensate them fairly? And, and you know, it should be transparent. I don't think, I at least don't have a problem with that. But, but how do you do that and at the same time deal with the issues that are more, uh, or, or becoming um, bigger as health reform probably leads to more uh, government payments. And, and so things like Medicare and Medicare are gonna uh, become even bigger uh, dollar budgets or some sort of government program. And, and so instances where you have the government in essence paying for more of our devices uh, and, and making sure that there's not unfair payments to the doctor. So I don't know, I'm sort of, I mean, I don't have the answers. I know we're spending a lot of time and money thinking about it um, and trying to keep everybody happy, which is, is a big uh, challenge. Yeah. Chad, I have a question. Do you, do you care if the companies you acquire are compensating physicians one way rather than another? Yeah, so from the M&A side of things, so, and which is what I do day to day, yeah, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at that, if there's a, a big uh, physician ownership interest, that's a problem, typically, or something we have to get, I say a problem, something we would really look into and, and try to, um, uh, f f candidly, ultimately, having physician equity ownership, I think, is, is something that's going away. Um, as you know, we've talked about that before. So, and, and so, and, and we're seeing less of it, which is a good thing. Um, Likewise, seeing just big uh, physician payments one way uh, or another, consulting or royalties. Again, not necessarily a big issue, but something we will really look into, both just from the propriety, you know, is, are these proper payments, as well as just from how is this company making money or what's its commercial plan. If we take it over and we have a bunch of customers who are different, who don't get along with the, you know, the, the customers at the company, what's that gonna mean for revenue? I mean, it gets, that's sort of the nuts and bolts um, side of things. But, but yeah, it, it, and the transparency has only sort of exacerbated all those um, concerns. So JP, what's your take then from uh, on when you start considering M&A exit strategies and the effect that these regulations have on valuation and risk assessment? Dennis alluded to the quality of revenue that uh, I think becomes the, you know, the underlying question for physician-owned uh, you know, situations. And, and it doesn't mean it's bad technology. Sometimes some of the best technology might originate in that, in that fashion, and there's physician owners uh, that uh, are now going to be subject to more transparency if they stand alone as, a, as an independent company or if they go down the M&A path. Uh, so we're seeing a wide variety of, of reactions to, to that physician ownership. And uh, you know the reactions are quite quite varied, and, and it does affect private capital, public capital, and ultimately M and A exits. Uh, in the private capital, uh, really across the board, you have reactions from, you know, if there's physician ownership of a level uh, of materiality, we're just not touching it. We're not going to go there, uh, which is an unfortunate situation. Uh, from a valuation standpoint, others have taken the position that if there's physician owner revenue, we're just going to carve that out, and we'll look at valuation uh, absent any. Uh, physician owner driven you know revenue to the to the top line um, others have said well we'll certainly move forward but it's going to be subject to extensive diligence and we saw that in a number of situations last year um, you know where every email uh, correspondence of the company is diligence to really understand the underlying interaction that the company has with um, with the physician group uh, whether they're advisors or owners uh, to understand you know at a real fundamental level what 
what the context, again, of those are. Uh, there's another dimension there, and I think it, it's probably related more to a specific group of companies that have you know, been subject to some DOJ and deferred pros prosecution agreements. Um, the Office of Inspector General has, um, you know, has a, a view into a lot of those companies, uh, and the companies have taken a position that in some cases they need to preview with the OIG uh, what you know, certain risks they've identified as part of their diligence process. Other companies have said, look, we'll close, but we do have to preview this post-announcement uh, of any deal uh, with the OIG and get a quasi-blessing from the OIG before they close on it. You can imagine the, the complications in an M&A scenario, what, you know, what, what that will lead to. Uh, if, and you know, I haven't seen any go down the path yet, but, but that is the perspective of, of some of the consolidators that are, um, <clears throat> I think, under that current regulation. So it has, I think the transparency is having you know, vast effects out there. I'd add one more dimension to it, and, and that's you know, physician owners who um, don't want to be subject to that transparency have asked for exits from a lot of private companies. And uh, you know, they're not necessarily looking for top dollar, which creates an interesting board dynamic if there's a board representative of that physician owner group uh, who's looking for an exit. Um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's just another layer of tension. You already have a tension of, of a syndicate typically within these private companies of have and have not, you know, financial investors, those who have capital and those who don't. And now you have another dimension of a physician group that's, that's got a representative who says we need our, our equity out because we, real or perceived, don't want to, um, you know, have, have some perceived conflict out there. So, Can I you. add one thing? Because you brought up a good point. And in the, terms of practical advice, um, back to the, the M&A um, things we're working on recently, as OUS becomes more of a conversation topic, and I know a lot of startups and, and entrepreneurs are thinking about that, as, especially as the U.S. path gets tougher. So you commercialize OUS, you usually use distributors, or often. As JP alluded to, uh, first of all, I'd say almost all of the consolidators, unfortunately, have some sort of consent decree, or you know they've had they have some issue, um, and as a result, we're under a lot more pressure to look also at the distributors, and whether I don't I'm not even sure uh, what the statute is if it's foreign corrupt practices or what, but um, we are under pressure to make sure the payments we make to distributors are proper and that they're somehow spending the money correctly, which is often an unknowable. But what it does mean is we have to hire firms, and um, JP's been on the other side of this before, firms to go out and interview the distributors and, and bless what they're doing somehow. And admittedly, it's sort of vague in general. But one, it takes time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a logistical nightmare sometimes, sometimes not. And two, it's just something to be aware of, especially, as I said, as this OUS commercialization becomes more of a topic, which I think it is, uh, to, to really be mindful of the distributors you're working with and make sure they know that, look, if you expect to sell this company in a year or two, you're going to be scrutinized. And so be mindful of that up front. Um, and, and, and that is definitely, I don't think Medtronic's unique at all in that regard is something we're really focusing more on. So Chris, are these changes affecting your in investment strategies or do you have other things to add? Uh, I would just reiterate where Dennis started that the uh, common practice now in small companies is to avoid use of equity or options. Obviously we still have situations where we have physician founders who have equity. I mean, you're, it's not going to be a, a situation where there is necessarily a prohibition on physician ownership, but to have the kind of variable comp that's tied to the success of the company, I think, is rapidly going away. Some of our companies that have been around for a while have some legacy uh, ownership issues there, but it's, it's definitely moving in the direction that Dennis described earlier. You may all be aware the FDA is uh, intending on making some changes to the 510K approval process. And for those that don't know, um, 510K is kind of an accelerated process uh, by which manufacturers can get FDA approval by showing substantial equivalence to a predicate FDA-approved device. I think 
one of the concerns is that these changes are causing the 510K process to be, I guess, more like the sort of the comprehensive, ex expensive pre-market approval PMA process. Um, so, needless to say, there's going to be an impact, I think, on investment requirements. Um, and uh, but but there also may be an impact on the establishment of reimbursement rates. I I guess I'd like to start with uh, Chris to get your sense of or how you feel that the 510k changes are affecting your investment analysis and your risk assessment. Are you having any issues, or are VC firms having issues raising funds because of these changes? The FTA circumstances, I think, are, are probably well known to most of the people in the room. Uh, I expect that many of you had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Shuren earlier this week when he was out here having a town hall meeting. My takeaway from that meeting and from the other discussions that I've been involved in is that the uh, hurdle that we will need to get over, whether it's a 510K product or a PMA product, is being uh, raised, and uh, that will have some long-term implications on what gets funded and kind of what falls off uh, into the category of, of not being worthy of investment. It will also have some impact, as, as Chad suggested, on uh, moving some emphasis outside the U.S. so that you don't have uh, all of your eggs in the U.S. basket and can move the technology forward in, in a different way. Those are longer term impacts. They'll be driven, I believe, by the changes that the agency proposes here in another 30 or 60 days, as well as by what the IOM does. Um, more important than that, though, in the short term is the lack of predictability and the uh, lack of direct communication uh, around uh, the review process, and in a number of instances that we've seen uh, changes in the rules of the road as, as you go through the review process. That is clearly impacting 510K type products, uh, in some cases with um, multiple reviews, in other cases with multiple rejections of predicates that the companies proposed, and in some instances, after long dialogue around the 510K route, actually hearing from the agency that it doesn't belong there, it belongs on the PMA side. And when you asked the question, Mark, about what is the impact, uh, I think generally the impact is a um, more cautious approach on the part of venture investors to products that lack clarity. If you're in a product area where the path has been shown to be repeatable and predictable, it makes it a little bit easier. But in a number of new product areas, in the absence of a clear path, it's easier to simply move your focus somewhere else and to kind of move toward later stage uh, opportunities where, where more of the risk has been taken out. So long term, I think the hurdle rates will go up. There will be uh, a higher bar for companies to get funded because the cost of getting the regulatory work done will be greater. In the short term, uh, you have some of that going on, but probably more important is just the chilling effect that the uncertainty is having on investment decisions. Yeah, so JP, to that, to the, that end, what are you seeing as far as the impact that this will have on, on deals getting done and you know, valuation analysis? I think the unfortunate thing is to have paralysis around financing those type of, uh, that uncertainty, basically. I mean, there is a price. Uh, there is a discount that should be, should be uh, reasonable at some, at some level for, for risk. And I think the, the most unfortunate thing that we're seeing is just general paralysis and, and sometimes, uh, you know, uh, firms saying we're, we're not going to invest in any PMA products and, and, um, uh, at any level. Uh, you know, maybe sometimes they argue we don't want to be predatory or viewed as predatory based on other syndicate members in the, in the company already and don't want to come in with such a lowball offer that we offend somebody. Uh, you know, I think that's just, it's just unfortunate. Maybe that's, maybe that's a convenient excuse. Maybe it's real. My sense is, you know, there's a lot of technology that probably should be funded. I think a year from now, a lot of people might be looking back at this, 
this environment in terms of financing opportunity as a window of opportunity that was missed if they didn't put capital to work uh, and take advantage of you know, what is arguably an uncertain time, but still there's good technology that ultimately needs to be brought to the marketplace and, and uh, in, in the long run is going to be acquired by a lot of the consolidators like Medtronic and others. So I guess my general view is that there is a price for the risk. I, I would make the metaphor of dealing with the FDA as kind of like uh, how, how you keep your marriage together. <laughs> uh, it's uh, when, when your significant other suggests that maybe you should do something, the marriage goes great if you just say yes. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, that's, that's a smart that, man. You know, that's, you know, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, that's what you have to do with the FDA. Um, uh, the regulatory risk is real. Uh, what you've heard here is real. There's no question about it. The FDA is increasing um, their scrutiny. Uh, the world is becoming more technical. The other thing is, is that what happens is the FDA keeps getting smarter. You know, as your product is in the pipeline, because they see other products and they learn other things from competitors, some of which are good ideas, and they want to apply that bar to all the different products in that sector, it's almost unavoidable that they won't, that they won't uh, change their opinion along the way. Um, and so when you see hints or suggestions, or maybe you should consider this, and um, it's a big problem, you know, regulatory risk. But I think the way you mitigate that in the, in the company is, is not only to just start the clock moving immediately on everything they suggest, um, but even think it through further in terms of what are things that you think they might think of that you haven't, re you, you know, that that you're worried about. Just start the clock on that and, and start doing it. I, uh, I think that's that that's the only prudent way to um, to deal with it inside the company. But the bar has clearly gone up, and it's a problem. You know, we we are in a PMA track. You know, so so that's. You know, one of the nice things about the PMA track is, is that you're going to wind up with, at the end of the day, a specific label for what you're doing, and it's going to be a novel therapy, and uh, and you'll probably be in a, you know, fairly, at least at the beginning, you, you know, have a restricted number of competitors. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the nice part. It is exp expensive. It's more onerous. Um, uh, and I think there may be, at the end of the day, some extra value for that. Um, you know, the problem with the 510K process is, is that you get, I mean, you can get there faster, potentially, but there's this issue of, of device, you know, device creep, you know, and that the predecessor device that you've proven yourself equivalent to um, may have slightly different indications than what, than what you're actually there for. And then you're into that labeling issue and, you know, and you can, you know, and, and, and how do you promote your device? And, um, and, and so that, and also other competitors can get there more easily. And so those are, those are shortcomings of the 510K process that even applied correctly in, in the way it was originally intended to, uh, I think make it a little bit less valuable in approval um, than if you have a, a, a PMA. And Chad, what, are you seeing any trends coming out of these 510K changes? Yeah, from the broad, you know, Medtronic operating perspective, I mean, the, the trials in, in areas, all areas, but especially cardiology, which is, a, you know, obviously there's a lot of important large markets there, are getting longer and longer. So one theme is, I mean, you can only do so many big PMA trials, even if you're J&J &J or Medtronic, you can only do so many DEF studies. And so, and, and it, the, the, it reverberates all the way down the chain. How many DEF startup companies are there today? Any? I mean, very, very few. How many uh, transcatheter valve companies are there today? There's a couple, and they're, they're doing really well. There's not a lot of new ones. There's not a lot of, you know, there's a few mitral valve companies. Uh, so, I mean, these are big, important markets where there's a lot of sick people. And this gets back to that innovation um, discussion. Who's going to invent those devices? I, it's a very tough model in, in areas like that as a venture investor to, to make money or it's at least very risky, it's, it's more binary, You're either gonna hit a home run or, or not. So there's this whole opportunity cost concept 
that bleeds in and, and affects big companies like ourselves as well as, as uh, startups. And the other thing I think that's interesting and will affect many of you in the room is back to sort of nuts and bolts, the exit. When do you get taken out? How far do you have to go in your clinical activities before you can be a viable target? And what do people like Medtronic or J&J or Abbott Boston want to see? There's not an easy answer to that question. It depends a lot on the type of trial, on the expertise of the, the company that may be looking at you. Um, and I, I don't, it, it's going to evolve, but I think um, it's a pretty fair bet to say that big companies will look to take out development stage companies earlier. That uh, you are gonna see people, at least like us, I can speak for Medtronic, we are going to want to conduct some of these PMA studies or larger 5, 10Ks ourselves. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, we'll probably buy earlier, but for less dollars. And you know, we'll, we'll see um, how that kind of reverberates through the investment community. Remember when, when I was at Medtronic going through the annual budgeting process, and always there were projects that seemed worthy that didn't get funded, because you simply say, where am I gonna get the best returns and, and the money moves there. That same thing I think is happening in venture investing generally, and when I say the bar is being raised, what will happen is technologies that address somewhat smaller markets simply won't get funded. And I think it's ironic that the agency, at the same time that they're doing this review, which is likely to lead to a more stringent environment, has another group working on how do we promote technologies for smaller diseases. Well, you're creating more of them, not solving the problem, when the, the evidence burden gets put at a level where you simply can't justify the amount of investment to drive the kind of clinical trials that are needed. So it, it's gonna be interesting to see if we can find the right balance point that allows technology to move forward and address some of these medium-sized clinical conditions without having burdens that are simply too high to justify the risk associated with the investment. So you had mentioned that you were at the town hall, the FDA town hall meeting. Um, I was not, but I heard that uh, it was not without drama, but there was, uh, it was a collaborative, not a combative effort. Some, some of the comments were, uh, had a little edge to them. I mean, there's clearly um, a lot of frustration around what's going on in the current uh, regulatory environment. Uh, Dr. Shuren did a very good job of laying out his priorities. I don't think there was much, if anything, in the general statement of priorities that causes concern. Uh, the problems play out in how some of those broad concepts, which uh, are laudable in one sense, impact us when they actually get implemented through the, the uh, organization broadly. And the, uh, the speakers as a group, I think, were consistent in saying that the uncertainty, the lack of predictability, uh, the lack of transparency was making it very difficult to move things forward and, uh, and a lot of concern. So a uh, lot, lot of very thoughtful comments, I think, shared. In the end, though, I believe that the agency is a political agency that will respond primarily to what the political pressure is that they perceive. And if they are most concerned about Senator Grassley and Congressman uh, Waxman, they're gonna continue to move in the direction they're going. Uh, if there gets to be a little bit of, of concern from the other side that we are putting innovation at risk, putting competitiveness at risk, then maybe the, the pendulum will move back to the middle. So t to that end, I, w we are confronting serious regulatory and economic challenges, the med tech industry is. Um, and so I wanted to get each of your sense of, you know, considering these challenges, where are the opportunities? Um, you, you know, if, you know, I think that there are, um, opportunities probably everywhere. You know, I, you know I, one of the things I like to quote is um, 
it was in, a, and this was in the National Geographic, but in the year about 19, 1918, um, uh, uh, the head of the U.S. Patent Office made a recommendation to Congress that the U.S. Patent Office should be uh, closed down because um, pretty much everything that could be invented had been invented. Um, uh, and uh, fortunately that uh, they decided not to do that. Um, I, I believe that actually uh, when you have a situation like what medicine confronts today, which is uh, all of the challenges, the challenges are what create the opportunity. Uh, and so, uh, um, and, and what makes innovation great is, is, is um, it's only obvious after it happens. Uh, and right now I think that, that in, in um, many specialties people are struggling for the next invention, but it's gonna be there. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that in cardiovascular, which is the area we're in, I would say that it's probably been going on now for, um, you know, I've heard big companies say, well, we kind of think cardiovascular is kind of done, you know, all the stuff has been invented, and so we're looking at other organ systems. Uh, uh, I, I, would, I would make a, uh, 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 um, a prediction that we are going to see interventional cardiology be dramatically different uh, 10 years from now than what it is right now. Uh, and uh, and when, I, when I started, um, uh, well, when I was 10 years into my medical practice in cardiology, there was literally nothing that I was doing in, pre in clinical practice that I was taught in medical school. <laughs> uh, and I think that, uh, uh, I think that, I mean, angioplasty didn't exist, stents didn't exist, electrophysiology didn't exist, echocardiography didn't exist, um, um, CT scans of the heart didn't exist, Plavix didn't exist, Lipitor didn't exist, um, and that was 10 years into practice. Um, I'm certain that the next innovations are coming. I'm a bit more of a cynic by nature, actually, but I'll try. <laughs> um, uh, you can stay up. Here, okay. <laughs> One thing I was going to interject before, and in Dennis's prior comments, the whole, the higher the clinical evidence um, that is required, the more of a barrier it will become. So sort of paradoxically today, it's spine takes spine. That's the poster child. A ton of companies, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Now, you know, a lot fewer. The ones that likely are going to survive and prosper are the ones that actually did get approval and, and got clinical evidence. So uh, I can tell you uh, like at Medtronic as well as in the startup world, I think we're beginning to view clinical evidence as a strategic barrier. It's not just getting approved. It's like IP. It, it can protect you and, and uh, give you more value uh, on a relative scale than it did uh, probably in the past. The other thing I'd say is, look, we're not sure what's gonna happen and we can sort of define trends, but uh, you know, I, is, I've been on talking to some people in tech. I mean, the other thing I think we should think about and we are at least is innovating in different ways. I think med tech, um, and in some ways it's not an old industry. I mean, medical device technology has been around for a while, but the, the interventional, entrepreneurial, venture-backed sort of model has been, I mean, the graphs you saw before, the, it's 10 years and maybe bled into the mid-90s, but in some ways it's a very young industry. And we've been uh, focused on innovating technology and pushing that boundary. But look at tech. Their innovations around lowering costs, making supply logistics easier. Um, making things easier. And there's an example is, is hospitals and physicians are buffeted by all these different um, uh, uh, issues. One of them is, is their costs and their lives. And so how can we uh, make drug eluting stents? Maybe they don't, they have the same late loss as the ones on the market, but you can make them a lot cheaper or you can deploy them a lot more quickly. Uh, in, instead of always looking to advance you know, the technology. I think you need to do both, but I think out of this uncertainty, you may see different types of innovation and different types of business models. Sensors is another example. So, um, you know, as with many industries, if you read historically, you know, 
often uncertainty breeds new types of innovation mm -hmm. and new types of thinking. And you know, hopefully that will happen here. I think it will. JP, your thoughts? Uh, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic based on IPO markets uh, seemingly open, not, uh, not as robust as we've seen in historical periods. But you know, we have 9, 10x the, the IPOs this year that we had last year. Uh, I think you know, there's a general theme to, to the deals that we have seen come to market. There, there remains price sensitivity, and I don't think it's differentiated at an investor level than it is at a consumer level. It's just kind of a theme in this, this overall economy that people are looking for value. So there is price sensitivity. Um, you know, the one med tech deal that, uh, that's been done uh, was Dynavox, which we led, and, and uh, it was five times oversubscribed. I think it's a good indication of institutional interest. Uh, it priced at the low end of the range, uh, which suggests some price sensitivity, but uh, the five times oversubscription was, was very positive. Uh, there's another deal that we have on the road right now, which is on the other end of the extreme. So Dynavox had, you know, 105 million of trailing revenue growing 30% and 30% EBITDA margins. We have a company on the road today that's it's AIM listed. It's doing a US IPO. It'll delist uh, on the, uh, the AIM exchange. It's aspiring to do two and a half million of revenue this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's looking to price uh, as a multiple of 2012 revenue. Uh, it's a smaller IPO. So, you know, I think there's been a little bit of the back to the future here thinking. Uh, if you recall from the 90s, a lot of the IPOs that came out were 30, 40 million dollar raises. That's inflated over the years, you know, where 75 or 100 million was really the minimum to get the right kind of float and institutional interest. You know, this one will be closer to 40 million and probably, you know, somewhere around 130 million type market cap. So a very different profile deal. Uh, Kips Bay is in registration, Manny Villafana's company. I think it'll be very interesting to see if these come out, uh, just an alternative, you know, pathway and access to capital, which is very helpful as, as it relates to uh, exits for, you know, for um, VCs and private equity. Uh, I think private equity has, you know, has recognized some opportunities to, you know, to come in and play uh, at, um, you know, in some of the later stage financings. And I think we'll see more of that given the, the surplus of funds sitting in those private equity funds today. The credit markets, we run a buy side deal that was announced last week. The, uh, the term sheets that came in from lenders, I think is, is as good as, as I've ever seen. And we're seeing you know, capital, um, uh, cost of capital from, from these, these banks at, at um, you know, is LIBOR plus you know, 125, 150, num number of term sheets in that range, no floor. I mean, that's less than 2% cost of capital. That's gonna drive a lot of deal activity amongst um, both private equity and ultimately strategic. So I think there's a lot of positive signs to suggest that that activity only goes up from here. The opportunities, I would agree, are, are definitely there and there will continue to be innovation. Uh, I think the challenge for, for those of us who are investing is to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of capital invested against whatever the opportunity is. And PMA products, we, we do a lot of investing actually at Affinity in products that are on the PMA path. Just need to make sure you're in a market that supports the amount of investment Similarly, if, if you go with a regulatory approach that isn't as great, maybe you could conserve capital and your exit doesn't need to be as great. So it's all about what that ratio is and I think being smart about where capital is spent. I certainly agree that clinical data has become more important and will become increasingly important uh, as companies need to establish not only regulatory path, but reimbursement path and commercialization path in the absence of data, that is just going to be very difficult to do. So uh, we are not pessimistic, but we are a bit cautious as we look at investment opportunities and we'll continue to look across the range and most importantly look for the ideas that when you look back on them, people go, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. It's just Seeing them from this side rather than from that side is sometimes difficult. And accomplish more exits going forward here. 